advanced so much and the neuroimaging has advanced so much now the surgeons are able to reach to the different corners of the brain uh, and able to resect the tumors traditionally neuropathology was mainly neuro autopsy okay so from there we have learned a lot of things i said i told you you need to know what are the different parts of the brain before we can understand the neuropathology and the tumors so here is the quick recap this was one of my autopsy cases that i collected from uh, when i was a fellow so this was this is we are harvesting the brain here the first incision goes from one year to the next year and you can see the scalp being reflected anteriorly and posteriorly exposing the underlying skull then what we do we saw the bone here in a w or a m shape whichever way you you see it then you take this skull out and the underlying in situ brain is exposed a part of the dura is already um, shelled and peeled and you can see the underlying brain tissue and you can also see the middle meningeal artery that coming into focus here it's very tight compartment it tells you this uh, rupture of this middle meningeal artery will give rise to extra dural hemorrhage okay so this is how the brain looks in situ at the time of brain autopsy okay. here we have taken the whole um, dura out and you can see the entire brain is exposed and once this dural support is removed the weight of the brain is such that it starts falling down so you can start seeing you can see some space here because it is coming behind on the head end of the person where i, I was trying i was taking the brain out so what we do is that we gently remove everything then the tentorium will come into picture because we have to gently cut it out and then to deliver the brain we have to here you can see the basilar artery if it if uh, i am not wrong you can see some plaques here okay yellow color this is atherosclerosis you can easily see most patients with diabetes have atherosclerosis that is right visible right away when you take the brain out so without even history we can tell that this patient may be having diabetes so that is the uh, pathology that we see in diabetic patients in the brain okay then once we deliver the brain uh, cut the tentorium we go as deep as possible and sever the spinal cord and then deliver the brain intact Okay, so we here we have the cerebellar hemispheres here behind that is the cerebral hemisphere and the brain stem here and in this panel here you can see the basilar artery two vertebral arteries joining now the atherosclerotic plaques have become much more visible you can see the beautiful uh, olfactory nerve with the olfactory bulbs here and these are the optic nerve these are the optic nerves forming the uh, optic chiasm then they become optic tract and here we sitting here on over the below the basilar artery is the pons so these are the two temporal lobes here and the uncus comes somewhere around here so this is all that is visible to us we just make a gross um, impression of the case we weigh it quickly and then we fix it for two long weeks before the brain can be cut it has to be fixed for two long weeks okay it is suspended in the river in the same fashion the way you are seeing it it will be suspended you put a twine thread below the basilar artery and tie it to the lateral aspects of the bucket and then you hang it for two weeks in in formalin and then after that you wash the brain and start slicing it so these are the various planes we use to do the um, brain um, autopsy slices Okay. So this is what we call as the coronal plane. Coronal plane takes the slices from anterior to posterior, from the, uh, uh, the, uh, from the glabella all the way to the occiput. And this is the axial plane I was talking to you, right? Because it goes from the vertex all the way down. And this is the sagittal plane which are already introduced to. See, one thing I wanted to tell you was when this is the basilar artery coming here and it sends directly branches into the um, upon substance of the pons. So when there is sudden increase in the brain volume, it will it will start descending down. What happens is that the brain substance is descending down, but the basilar artery is stable because it is stabilized. And then what happens? The the vessels that are coming directly into the pons come under pressure and they tear at the right angle where there is a joining. So as a result of which, when there is edema and this uh, brain displacement occurs inferiorly you get what is called as the dure hemorrhage you can see them they are always in the midline you can see this so patients with cerebral edema eventually develop pontine hemorrhages these are not direct primary but secondary hemorrhages they are called they are called a dure hemorrhage so that is why you have to be very careful so surgeons what they do when they anticipate that there is going to be edema they open the skull and let the brain expand exteriorly not on the inferior aspect so that many a time you take you get the skull caps they are kept in the refrigerator after a couple of months they go and put it back when all the when the healing occurs after the surgery so, so this is the some of the important things when you go into most 
I I am I have not witnessed autopsy in India. I'm being very honest with you all. But in United States, across all program neuropathology programs, use this cutting method in the coronal plane. I'm assuming that this is the same thing followed here also. We cut all the slices from anterior posterior in the coronal plane. Two things happen because it gives us the symmetry. What happens on the right side we can see compared to the left side. And second, we can exp the all the uh, structures are beautifully exposed at this level. This is the slice at the uh, mammillary body section. These are two mammillary bodies. These are two lateral ventricles. You can see the septum, and this is the corpus callosum. And you can see one of the foramen of Munro coming on the on the right side. When we cut the brain, right is right, left is left. But when we look at the images, right is left, left is right. When you see the images, I'll tell you why. Okay. So this is the third ventricle. Beautifully, you can see now in this plane. Okay, but the aqueduct and the fourth ventricle are difficult to visualize because this is all taken away. Here you are, you are seeing the hippocampal formation. We are slightly anterior. The, the characteristic uh, cornoamonous pattern is not visible here, but still you can see the hippocampal formation here. And here we are seeing the three, the three structures here. This is the globus pallidus and this is the putamen. So this is the globus pallidus interna and this is the externa. And you can see the pencil fibers coming out, not clearly visible in this particular plane. And you can see here, this is the part of the fibers that are descending. This is a white matter here. And you can see the beautiful cortical ribbon. That is a fine distinction between the fine line between the cortex and the white matter. And you can see that the fibers start to descend down at this plane. And this is the sylvian fissure here. And you can see the insular cortex. This is the temporal lobe here. And we can get the insular cortex. Okay. And... Uh, this is the caudate coming here on the either sides. Okay, in Huntington's and all, you can see this is a flat battering sign, we call it as. And, and the, uh, the structure that is present immediately above the corpus callosum is a cingulate. Okay? So these are some of the important structures you need to know because they affect when the tumor affects, when they say temporal insular cortex, you should know exactly where it is located. Okay, and because we don't get all these structures when we are assessing the sample at the grossing level. So this is the axial plane. Here you are seeing this is the anterior pole or the frontal pole and this is the occipital pole. And you can see again the beautiful cortical ribbon going all around. This is the frontal lobe here. And you can see the deep gray nuclei. Many times we see here radiologists and neurosurgeons talking about the deep gray nuclei. This is the gray nuclei here. These are the thalamus, caudate and the putamen coming here. Okay. So these are the two thalami and this is the putamen on either side and you can see the head of the caudate coming here. and this is the septum pellucidum coming around here. Between the two thalami will be the third ventricle usually. Okay, And you can see what these are the two structures that are coming right in the heart of the brain and the center. This is the internal capsule. So this is the anterior limb of the internal capsule and this is the posterior limb of the internal capsule. Okay. Now, if there is an internal capsule, some may people may be wondering, Madam, why is your internal capsule? Where is the external capsule? Some people did ask me. Okay. I said, yes, there is an external capsule also. This is the external capsule. What you're seeing on these confines is the external. Not much talked about, but it does exist. And there's, in, in fact, there's one more structure called extreme capsule. Okay. But this is around what way some people refer to the extreme capsule. So between the external capsule and the extreme capsule, there's a thin sliver of uh, gray matter, which we call it as a colostrum. Okay. Colostrum. So this is on either sides we are seeing it. And these are the two thalami here. And here is the pineal recess. See how the things change when we are looking in the different planes. Okay. When we see the axially, it looks different. The location seems different. And when we are in the sagittal plane, it looks different. See, here is the, in the sagittal plane, you are seeing the pineal recess here. Whereas in axial, you see it here. Okay. So here is the temporal lobe here. And sylvian fissure doesn't come into picture because we are going from top to bottom. Okay. You can see the slit-like ventricles here. All right. So I hope so far everything is clear. I see there is a pointer. Can, can you not see my pointer? Please somebody answer in the um, message box. This is this is my pointer here. Okay, so this is the internal capsule and this is the organ, basic organization in the axial plane. All right. So now why I took so much time and trouble to explain all that? This is why. Okay, now you see why it is, this is the MRI. MRI was actually developed to address the issues of the brain. The one of the most well-suited organ to be imaged by MRI is brain. 
okay in fact most developments occur because of the need for assessing the brain structure and function and the gross uh, morphologies so you can see again axial plane as i had explained to you it is going to be in a plane that goes from head tip of the head all the way down okay from uh, head to toe coronal sections goes anterior to posterior sagittal i said no coronal goes from yeah anterior to posterior and uh, sagittal goes from one ear to the other ear okay this is all this is a t1 post contrast images in all planes axial plane coronal plane and sagittal planes okay so far so good um, are we okay now the left hand panel on the upper hand side is showing the sagittal uh, view of the brain okay this is the mri section okay and you can see three structures everybody can identify cerebrum i hope so and the cerebellum structure okay and there's a brain stem in the center below and the whatever you're seeing in the uh, that's visible as dark is all the csf okay and then below that is the left hand there's one more mri panel on the left hand side lower left you can see here the, the this is a t2 signal t2 weighted image you can see the sorry is t2 or t1 player i'm a little bit confused now okay you can see something uh, part of the uh, tissue that is dark and some which which is uh, bright okay so those are the t1 t2 weighted sequences so these are basically how the uh, brain looks when you, when you do in different sequences t1 and t2 weighted sequences we call them okay so csf will be dark in t1 okay and it will be bright in t2 okay t1 and t2 sequences and let me go back here so here you can see in the center there is ventricles that are very very dark those are the ventricle and csf looks very dark on even t1 uh, post contrast what you see the bright spots all over those are the actual dye in the vessel post contrast dye that is circulating in the vessels you are seeing that that is the key to understand that there is a dye flowing through and it is a post contrast image we use usually use gadolinium to image the brain for contrast okay this is not right this is not right okay so these are the four pictures corresponding this on the left upper panel is going to be the sagittal view and similarly i am putting i have put already the um, gross image of the uh, one uh, right half of the brain which is uh, autopsy brain and uh, left is showing the axial view and uh, here the white matter is bright and the gray matter is gray okay the shades of gray i would call it. so this is usually a t2 sequence okay or it may be flares i'm not quite sure i have to correct and i'll get back to that but here you can see the white matter is white and the gray matter is slightly grayish to tan color okay the at the inferior aspect at centrally what you are seeing is the wing shake structure is the uh, brain stem in the center below that is the cerebellum and you can see what is colored area on the either side of the mid brain this that is the substantia nigra okay